Been a while. Been a while. Did you miss me? I can see you like through the air though. So I know. It's, it's a little bit you disconcerting. Look worse. <laughs> you look tanned. Do I? You actually do. I, I, people have been saying that and I don't know why. Because I haven't been doing anything in the sun. I mean, I've gone to a talent tanning salon. But... Yeah, but that can't be it. So stupid. <laughs> I am. Um, I've been t- being told by people that I'm taller. Yeah, you said and that I am. Um, I. I have always described myself as 183, six foot. You know, and I will start with the 183 because I believe in the metric system. But then I will say, six foot. I measured myself today, 186. I'm like approaching six two. Yeah. I, to be honest. I think you do look taller. Do you think that I look taller than I, when what your mental picture of me was last year? You're you're surprisingly tall. But you am got, I surprisingly tall comparative, like since last time, or no, just generally? In, I think in you've a, got like the the personality of a, like a a small person, a small person, yeah. well, not even a small person, like a like a medium like a person. person. But you are fucking. You're like a grasshopper. I'm lanky. You're fucking lanky. I'm Shit. lanky in person. You know what's funny about um being tall and speak not, from experience i'm not speaking from experience is that like people know what six foot looks like yeah like i i've i'm five foot eleven and a half now i'm not going to say to people that i'm five foot eleven and a half because that kind of looks like i'm splitting hairs <laughs> yeah. so i sometimes say i'm well, six foot and that, so every single time i've ever said uh i'm basically six foot i'm just rounding up yeah Every time I said that, someone's going, you're not six foot. People just know what six foot looks it's like. Effectively it's effectively like... not me, apparently. It's effectively like you saying, I'm 180 centimeters and and rounding up to, I'm 183. <laughs> and they're like, okay, mate, no, you're not. Yeah. That's, you're a 180 if I've ever heard of it. How do people know that? <laughs> but I think some of it's hair as well. Like, I think depending on the way that you make the top of your head look, it affects the height that people see you at. You think? I think if you have like long flowy hair, you look smaller. Like it's not if you, whereas if you have like spike, if you're using gel, your product, you're styled up there. Obviously, I mean, that's the most obvious way, but you'll, you'll look like you're adding another five centimeters, right? And by the way, I love your new spiked up gel look. Thank you. It's, it's, really, it's really, really working for me. I've got um, Those frosted blonde tips. streaks. Mm, very tasteful. <laughs> yeah. I, um, I was at a 90s party and I just thought, you know, this actually suits me. <laughs> the wind change. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then it all went bad. <laughs> I did it myself at home, and the um, the hairdresser said, "I can't beat that." No, yeah, it <laughs> it suits your personality. <laughs> Thank time, you for sure. I'm a small person inside a lanky person's body with small person's hair with blonde tips. Yeah, that's all. My that you can type ask of for. guy. <laughs> yeah. Um, you look a little bit just from this angle. Because I can't, so we're we're both wearing um, Santa hats at the moment. Because of course, this is our Christmassy uh, end of year celebration. At this angle, opposite you in real life, sitting with a uh, an armchair between us and well, a coffee table between us and an armchair each. In the shirt that you're wearing, you look a little bit like a sailor. You look a little bit like a sailor because I I couldn't see the I couldn't see the red dangly. um, What do you call the top of a Santa cap? The, uh, the dongle, the, the tassel, the did, we did we the dingle. We spoke about the what, like why do these nightcaps even exist? Like night what's caps. the what's the um? Do you think it's temperature based? Etymology of them, etymology, whatever. Well, that's the word, but that's also not what you mean. In does etymology either. sound like a word? It does. Does it actually, sound like a it word? It does sound like a word. Okay. Okay. So what Let's are we arguing about? Sorry, that was actually my fault <laughs> for interrupting. <laughs> <laughs> why are we arguing? <laughs> um. But I, I think we did look at, like, because in old kind of, it's like an English thing, isn't it? Like, totally. Night it's, caps. It's, it's the night before Christmas kind of style, isn't yeah. it? But why does it have the bobble? You, you, is it just fashion? Or is it serving a purpose? That's true. That's interesting. Because I what think the caps? idea of wearing a night cap, you know, like a, like a to literal... To keep your head warm? Yeah, I think that's probably what it is, you know, like British winters, you yeah. know, you're stumbling from one room to the... You might have to go outside is the other thing because there's no internal plumbing. Oh, yeah. You're outside, you've got to go, you don't want to get snow on your hair, you put on your night cap and your dressing gown and you head outside to take a shit. Yeah, what? I, w- I don't know that there's necessarily a, a purpose for the, the, the pommel on the end. The pom-pom? The pom-pom. I wonder if that's just an, an aesthetic evolution. It's fun. Just fun. It's just fun. It does add you look happier. Yeah, because it's like bouncy. 
Anything bouncy is fun. Anything bouncy is fun. That's you can put put that in stone. Etch that into glass. Hang it on my wall. Fracture.com, our first sponsor of the night, Fracture. Head to fracture.me for your discounted Christmas sales. Get get just get a good quote on the wall. <laughs> I love your house, by the way. Hmm. I, I should be clear, this is not my house. I'm back in Adelaide. Mark was back in Adelaide. Neither of us are in our houses at the moment. Um, but this is my parents' house. This is the best par- your parents' house. By the way, I love your parents. Mm-hmm. I love speaking to your dad. Mm-hmm. I feel really comfortable talking with your dad, making mm-hmm. jokes with your dad and your mom and your sister. Yeah. And I feel... Mm, part of the family. I do kind of feel part of the family. Like, I feel... I don't feel part of the family, but I feel like I can slip into the family and I feel like the dynamic's good. And you told me to have a glass of water when I came here because uh-huh. I think you thought it was, you know, I'd had three drinks mm-hmm. and you worried that I might say something uh, I was just controversial trying, or something. It wasn't even that. I just thought, you know, friends are friends, you know, yeah, just give me a water. Just give me a water. You've had two more beers don't since. I was, clearly wasn't fussed about don't the drinking. A, just don't give me a water. I'm just saying that you could have a water. It's Maybe still on yeah. the bench. Well, did you think I was acting drunk? Uh, did you? <laughs> no, <laughs> a hint of it. Did you? Just not. Not. I, I don't my, think. I don't my... think you were acting drunk. I. I. I'll. I will, I will concede that in my head, I was like, "Oh gosh, I wonder how strong Michael is going to come on right now." But that's my thing with your family, though. I, I look. I, I. I know that. I feel like I know my dad would be like... fine. I was. It was a little like, okay, what's my mum going to do? You know. But I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to lie. I resent that a little bit. I don't. It wasn't that I was concerned for the general state of the, you know, the interaction and the relationship. It was just. It seems like you were. I just said you've had too much, Michael. Put that wine down. No, give it to me, Michael. Michael, then, come back here. And then what give happened? Back, and then I gave it back to you, and no. everything worked out. No, that's not what happened. Oh, and then what happened was I grabbed a beer out of the fridge for you and dropped it all over the floor. Exactly. Yeah. And so, I, I'll own that. I cleaned it up. So you think that I'm a bit. Of a liability in some respects, you've you've made it more of a thing. I just thought, you know, I would just try and dampen down Michael's personality to make him more palatable to people that I care about. <laughs> there is a hint of truth in that. <laughs> and I know it. <laughs> I'm trying to pass this off like a just a crazy joke. <laughs> oh gosh! Welcome to Deep Thought, everybody. It's been it's been too long. There's been a few reasons. We'll get into them, but I'm sorry to have left you hanging for so long. And I hope that your Christmas season is great. This is a podcast in which we just recap the year, I guess, and and the lives of two uninteresting white men sitting through the air with me today in an armchair, looking like a bit of a sailor. Michael, say hi, Michael. Ho 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 ho. No, I thought you were going to go for Santa Claus. I thought you were going to go for a ho ho, like a mix a sailor and a Santa. A hoy, a ho. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm just saying those opportunities. Did you? Do you think? What do you think a sailor sounds like? A hoy. I have you ever met a sailor? Don't. Have you ever? Have you ever met a sailor? Are there still sailors? <laughs> yes. Are they called? Somali pirates Let's batten now. down these hatches and get to the sloop, <laughs> put that mast out and catch the winds before the sunrise. Okay. Well, I don't know. I I don't know if there are sailors anymore. There are definitely sailors. What do they look like? They're in the Navy. They wear stri- stripy shirts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and set hats. And mm. my name's Nick. Hi, Nick. Hi. Hi, Nick. Hi. Hi. Can you put sleigh bells over the um, uh, intro tune this week? Yeah, we that might be nice. sleigh built out by the end of this can episode. Just... Foreshadowing. Oh, hello. Foreshadowing. Can we just can we just ham it up with the Christmas pun intended? <laughs> <laughs> Audible clink of my teeth on the cup. Um, yeah, let's ham up this Christmas. Christmas. Let's ham up for Christmas. Let's ham up for Christmas. Um, I just got reminded that I really just need to do something quick, and which is um, remember the last episode we did, I gave a shout out to some people, and then I got some. Hmm. People saying, where was my what? shout out? Because I'm always See, listening. This is a problem. Um, so, and I wrote those people down. So Brilliant. I'm going to quickly give a shout out to... The Squeaky Wheels. Um, Dan Pekevsky. I don't think that's how you pronounce his name, but... It's Pekevsky. Pekevsky. Um, Dan, I love you. Love you, Daniel. And Nathan and uh, Nathan, Sam you. Thorne. Sam Thank Thorne. You for listening. I said Sam Thorne, didn't I? Did you? I can't Maybe. remember. I'm sorry, Sam. But those guys always listen, and they they listen to the point where they 
felt heard that they didn't get a shout out. So yeah, that's valid. Uh, it is I valid. think that really speaks about your sense of friendship. Oh yeah, I am completely self centered. Yeah. Um, thank you, Dan. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Nathan. Nathan. All three of you deserve special shout outs, and in some ways. This is actually more special than the people who got the shout out last time. It actually, is. so you're almost about fifty percent more special than those people. I'd hate to be those people right now who didn't yeah. get this kind of attention. <laughs> but just wait for the next episode. Just wait for the next episode. <laughs> um, where have you been, Michael? What's been happening in your life recently? What's new to report? Um, well, I just moved house, which is why we haven't really recorded. Is mm. that why we haven't recorded? Or is it just my no. general slackness? No, it was. It was actually your moving house because when you moved house, you didn't have internet. And that's, I still don't have internet. You still don't have internet. But that's really important when you're recording an online um, Skype web podcast. Oh, can I just say, this Skype call the is one of the way- clearest. <laughs> I've, there is almost no lag. Still some lag. But The, the uh, easiest way for us to record this podcast was to both fly to a different city together yeah. and meet there than it was to actually record when you were in Melbourne. Yeah. And I mean, look, I know that I, um, a lot of the technical issues, most of the time it's my fault, but well, the thing that we don't address is that we were living in the same city and then you moved to New Zealand. So why do we never talk about that? So really, if you're going to talk about the root treat, treating the root cause of the problem, mm-hmm. you moved to New Zealand, dude. Uh-huh. And, We've got technical issues because you moved to New Zealand. So I just wanted to float that. Okay. Put down the placard. But it's all good. It's Christmas. So I'm not holding onto a grudge, but I just need to let this go. Are you wearing green army shorts? I was in the Navy and this was all they had. Do you ride a bike? I'm not. No, I don't wear it. You've got the quads of a bike rider. That's a compliment. Thank you. I run and I have been using the inside bike while I've been here, but I don't think that would make such an immediate change. I don't think so either. Yeah. But I've, got, also, I've got some legs in there. Mm, we've got similar, I mean, I don't have, I don't have Ukrainian. Similar legs. Yeah. I, well, I don't know if I have Ukrainian thighs. It's the calves. It's the calves. I'm so I've sorry. Got, um, you, yeah, you, you've Welsh got Australian thighs, <laughs> but Ukrainian calves. Yeah. Um, the, uh, 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 oh, what were we saying before this? I forget. I was saying while well, we weren't doing the podcast because yeah. I've been moving here, so I moved house. You moved house. Blah, blah, blah. It's um, nice. It's been great. Three stories. Um, it's got a dumbwaiter. Um, that's what Emma calls you. Um, got a butler. Butler. Yeah. Yeah, you you, uh, you have a new flat, but because it's so new, it, it hasn't been plugged into anything, and so you couldn't get internet. And so yeah, that's why that happened. But then the other thing was that I was... Um, traveling back home to Adelaide as well. And so that threw things out and the lead up. And we're also both trying to finish something that you'll hear at the end of the episode, foreshadowing. Uh, I love that you say foreshadowing. I just like making the subtext text. I like it too. Uh, What have you been doing? You've got some things. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, You know, the thing that really sort of springs to mind is that uh, the scripted series that... Uh, a couple of friends and I had created and spent the past two years developing uh, is getting made. We got funded. So we uh, found a, we took it, we wrote some scripts for a, a six part comedy streaming series. We, uh, it's called Good Grief. Um, we found a production company that really liked it. They found a network in New Zealand that wants to air it. Um, and then we took all that, put it in for a, a funding round um, with New Zealand on air, who uh, very excitingly and graciously have funded us. And so in 2020, coming forward, we will, I will be spending the uh, first half and a bit of the year making a TV show that I created <laughs> with some friends, That's pretty which funny, is very wild and very exciting. Yeah. And baby. I cannot wait. Give me, give me. Give me a bit of a cheers. Oh, yeah, I'm super, super happy for you, man. That's it is so fucking awesome. It is one of those sentences that does not become more normal the more that I say it. Yeah. It's still very strange. And it, as I said, we've been doing this for the past couple of years in preparation, working towards this. And the um, the switch from a hypothetical, from an aspirational, from a, oh, wouldn't it be great if we got this person? Or wouldn't it be funny if we did this? To a very practical you know we're going to be shooting on these dates so make sure you're available <laughs> is is still a very strange and um yeah unfamiliar thing so yeah. 
um, yeah, that was that was sort of that took up a bit of my December as all that stuff came through as well. So that's the reason for our wee delay. Um, but exciting times for both of us. Well, yeah. Well, I'm. Uh, yeah, I said this to you at lunch, but I'm I'm really, really, genuinely happy for you, and really proud of you. Mm, and, thank uh, you. It seems like it seems mon- monumental in the in the in the way that I don't know feels like the start i reckon you're gonna be like a big you're gonna be a big shot i think yeah i don't know whatever that's we'll pressure see. whatever do you want to know so I'll, I'll, I'll jump in there for a second because so it's a comedy series it's um feels like the start of your wikipedia page oh great <laughs> um the uh so Part of the, the the way that we get funding for a TV series in New Zealand is through New Zealand On Air, which is a public funded um, entity. Um, and you have to put in a proposal. And in that proposal, you sort of describe the tone that you're after or the kind of style of, of show, whether it's comedy or drama or documentary or whatever. Um, and so you rely on shorthand effectively to kind of communicate an idea. And one of the... Um, reference points that we'd used both in the text and also in creating a mood reel to kind of communicate in a trailer form from other people's shows what the vibe we were going for was, uh, was Fleabag, the brilliant Phoebe Waller-Bridge series and also like a masterpiece. Um, And so I had described to my dad that we had used that as like a a shorthand um, of the, you know, the mix of comedy and drama that we were going for. And while well, not expecting it to be that that level of accomplishment, and he, um, after the news came through, um, and still very proud and obviously excited, uh, came back and he sort of sat down and he was a bit like, okay, so, you know, what's your you know grand idea? Like, what's your big sort of flea bag thing? You know, like uh, you've got like a really deep theme or like a message for the season or like a really you know, sophisticated kind of concept underpinning all of this. And, you know, like, I just want to know how it's it's going to be like Fleabag. And I just had to be like, okay, just going to recalibrate our expectations here a little bit. This is my uh, first TV show. It will not be an internationally successful Amazon, like original series from a once in a generation kind of authorial voice. It'll just be three people's hopefully pretty funny streaming series <laughs> and let's not let's not aim for you know best of 2010s lists uh kind of uh international success just yet let's let's you know how old is uh phoebe waller bridge uh, i think she's in her 30s late 30s she's um she's pretty young but i, I it was very endearing and and my dad you know didn't apologize or whatever, but seemed to understand that, that, you know, it's, it's stepping stones as well. You can't, it's a very rare person who can come out the gate with like a <laughs> truly classic piece of television. Yeah. Um, and indeed Fleabag wasn't that either. The first season was good, but the second season was terrific. Um, so yeah, either way, it's just, it's been funny to sort of, now that we know it's going to be a real thing, now that the practicalities are setting in and the times and the shoot dates and the production schedule and everything is, is it's real. Now all of a sudden we have actual questions about quality where it's like, okay, shit, we've got to try, like, I want this to be good now. <laughs> you know, we, we've got to really work hard at this. Um, so uh, how do you, um, how do you manage the, well, how, I guess you haven't, necessarily done it yet but how do you manage the quality control because i've always wondered about how it seems when you hear about like filmmakers or actors even talking about movies that they that they're doing or tv shows that they're doing that they you can like a script but you don't necessarily know how it's going to turn out and there are so many factors at play so do you like I, mean, I know this is like the first time you're doing this, but like, is that in the back of your mind and how, like, do you have agency over the overall product? It's, um, you, you're totally right. Um, I, and you do see some people, you know, out on the press tours for a Hollywood blockbuster 
who were having to be there, you know, they, they were in the film, but I think you can tell when they're not like super jazzed about it or not like super passionate. They're like, this is just a movie and yeah. it's kind of okay. And other times you can be like, oh yeah, this one, they actually really care about this. Sure. Um, but there's but, like people, people you can get in, um, like you can see actors getting embarrassed by certain things and, and so much of it's out of their control. So but that's, they've got that, a lot, yeah. that lot was what writing was... on it. You know, you got to have trust and that's why you always hear about actors talking about like directors because mm. they're like, oh, well, I can trust this guy. Yeah. Because he's not going to embarrass me. Exactly. And that's the thing. Those people in those roles, for the most part, unless they're like a big, big name, they wouldn't have a final say or even any say really in the edit. So that's why it is sort of through um, trust and agency. You'd be like, well, you know, Christopher Nolan's probably knows what he wants. So I'll just do what he says and believe that he's got the vision to pull it together. Yeah. For us, because we created the show, um, Eve, Grace and I, Eve and Grace will be starring in it as well. So they will be both the creators and the stars, which does give them moment to moment control over their performances where, you know, if those were two different roles, that that's two people's voices or two perspectives on a character yeah. that are um, potentially at odds or, you know, approaching it from different directions. So because they are actually creators with us, with me, um, and we have some great partners in the production company, Brown Sugar Apple Grant, and with the network TVNZ, they, I mean, ultimately everyone's taking a gamble at the same time, aren't they? Because we're taking a gamble that we're not going to look like idiots and that people will like it and that it's funny. And the production company is taking a gamble that this script that we, or series that we wrote is, you know, actually worth creating. And that network's taking a gamble that people are going to want to watch it at the end. So everyone together, hopefully in the best of intentions, is being like, well, you know, I think this could work. Yeah. It and sounds like it. all the elements are there and that, like. Yeah. But there is no guarantee. I mean, every great director has made a shitty film as well or most at least um or a film that probably did well but they themselves look at and think that's not exactly what i wanted it to be yeah for whatever reason um so in a long-winded answer to your question i hope i i i will i'll be working with the um my partners on the scripts for the next couple of months and then I hope, expect to be around the set when they're shooting it um, to keep an eye on how that all goes. And then I hope slash expect to be seeing edits as it comes through and be able to contribute to, you know, the tone of that or the pacing of that or even selecting takes and that sort of thing. So I think because, relatively speaking, New Zealand is a fairly small industry and the number of people that are working on this project is fairly small, it's not like we're dealing with Warner Brothers who needs to make $200 million off the release of it or whatever. Yeah. I think that guarantees us slightly more input in it than if it was, say, a script that I'd written and sold to, a, like a movie script, say. If I'd done a Dan and sold it, that's kind of out of your hands then once it leaves the writer's you know, um, control. It becomes everyone else's job except them. Whereas with us, because we're sort of slightly more embedded in various aspects of it i think we'll get to hopefully make it in the in the image that we want make it fit our vision yeah. but who knows i mean that's part of the exciting thing isn't it part of the the joy of television and of collaborative art is and i'm not calling our show art but you know the um the opportunity for different voices and different ideas to come from collaboration where you might have an idea of what this character reads like on the page. And then you find an actor who just delivers it so unexpectedly and so brilliantly that you like have to change your picture of this character because it's better Mm. or the same with a director. You might picture it shot in a certain way or frame a scene in a certain way and they've just got a different idea. And that's exciting, you know, to, to have other people with good, hopefully good taste, but also like good intention, bring something to the table. Totally exciting. If you can, um, if you can learn how to relinquish the control in that, which is a, which is a tough thing in itself. I I, had a little bit of that with like music when I've written a song Mm. and then I've had, you know, Ben come in and like, this is the kind of uh, drum, drum 
thing that I'm I'm thinking, and then it's just something different. It's like okay, now I'm completely happening to uh, to change my idea of what the song was. But learning to give that up is yeah. exciting in itself, and to find ways in which that's uh, uh, not just ways that that to that to realize that that can actually make it better than what your original it can idea make was. It come alive, yeah, yeah. yeah. The um, I've I've had a little bit of experience with that back when I was working at the production company, um, because we would you know like I'd write a song parody or something like that, and it would go out and they'd shoot it and they'd come back. And then you're like, okay, that is not what I thought it was going to be at all. But then you <laughs> sit down in the edit and you realize as they put their take on it, oh, I get it now. I see right. what you saw in it, you know. So well, I've had a little bit of that? practice from that. Are you a control freak? I think I am a little. Well, I think you are. No offense. Uh, yeah, I mean, I definitely in, in certain aspects of my life. I'm trying to think specific through the lens of the the writing and the collaboration process. I think that I have, I think that when I'm uh, uh, controlling uh, or again, I don't want to say controlling. I'm, I'm definitely opinionated about what my vision was originally. And that because I think I'm fairly good at expressing why I believe something about a choice or why this character should not do this or why we should set this scene here or what we need for the flow of the season or that sort of stuff. Because I think I'm fairly good at expressing that. I tend to be fairly, uh, I like like beholden to it. Like I I I do believe in it because I've thought it through. That doesn't mean that I am always resistant to changing away from that. But I think I'd like to think that my opinions on that come from a place of some consideration. Yeah. So it takes someone to provide a counter position or an argument with that same degree of explanation or logic for me to be like okay yeah no i see that let's try it the other way yeah okay uh, what about you how did you find you, you talked about the um the music side of it as well but like is there in the creative process down to the minutiae if someone was like this shouldn't be an f sharp this should be like a an f natural you know like how 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 finicky does your vision or your control get when i was doing uh, brokers mm. I felt like that my I feel like I had a, a very clear vision of what it was mm -hmm. uh, so, always like tonally or song to song like you knew exactly the mood you were trying to get across in the song or yeah. okay yeah. I re like yeah no I think that's accurate and I think because I was building the songs mostly myself and with David it was it was we basically could do it ourselves or at least yeah. you know it was a two-person composition and then sort of the arrangement or the expression with ben and laura and stuff came a little later yeah um but it's i, I hear that a lot with um with artists in whatever field um maybe especially musicians but like if you have if you have a clear vision the artist part of it is translate the translation between what's in your brain to to that point where it's a, an actual thing, an actualized mm. piece, um, and that that can be with like I mean, a script and um, music and anything. But I think, um, yeah, learning to I think probably with the music stuff, it was probably a little bit more controlling than I should have been, and I should have allowed. Um, the individual players to have their own thing, but I don't know. Mm. I was just learning that too. If I would do it again, I would probably. But you could, you you, you only know that from age and wisdom. You know, like yeah. you couldn't. I don't think you could have made that decision differently at no. that moment either. But I think it is something but you can that, look back that and is, be like, okay, going forward, I would do that. A level of maturity mm. in allowing outside elements to come in and make let's make a thing together. But also was, confidence, because part of that yeah. is being like, oh, I don't want the other person to be bringing better ideas than I have because I need to believe that my ideas are good, right? Yeah. You, you need to be both confident and vulnerable to be able to let other people come in and say, I think we could do this better. Or I, I've got this idea. What do you think? Yes. Yeah. I just keep looking at this thing and I keep thinking of the vagina. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's weird? I'm sure that 
four years ago, three years ago, we did like a Halloween episode in this house in this exact same room. And I think you said the same thing. (laughs) I'm pretty sure you can go back to like episode 40 or something and and find you saying the same thing. (laughs) (laughs) Um, the, The difference I think between music and script writing specifically is that a script is by definition going to be a collaborative yeah it, it, it is stage one of a multi-stage as process. soon as you employ an actor yeah well th- they say you know um i'm parroting a, a, a cliche at this point but um they say that a film is written three times on the page by an actor and then again in the edit room and at every stage of that you have new voices coming in and the old person steps away and the actor says okay i'm going to deliver this line this way and i'm going to emphasize this word and then in the edit room, you've got, you know, four takes, these different angles. And the way you mix all that together again changes the meaning of how people interpret things. Yeah. Um, and so at every stage, you know, it is literally being shaped and rewritten. Um, yeah. And when you're making music, you're sort of, particularly if you're as a solo artist or, you know, at least directly creating what you're composing, you make it and then that's that's the end product right there. There's no one else that's going to come in other than a, like a mixer maybe and, and fiddle your levels a bit. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is quite different. It's not invalid. It's just an observation. Yeah. Um, oh, that's good. I'm really excited for to see to see how Good Grief comes alive. Uh, yeah, thank you. I um I have switched in my head now from uh being willing to throw out super like 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 clear picture of the season arc and the character stuff and the story and and what happens in the show to being like oh I shouldn't actually I don't need to give this away anymore people can watch the final product so um you know talking now in abstraction about where the season goes or what the kind of tone we're trying to get across rather than specifics because it'll be it'll be real people can watch the thing i don't want to spoil it oh one of the um we'll get off me in a second but the um thank you for okay don't tickle my toes okay keep that to the bedroom um the um the uh so part of the like i've been very uh interested and keen to include this include you and include um you know parents and stuff in the process of applying for this funding and showing things like the proposal document that we um created to submit to try and get funding um and you know the mood reel and that sort of stuff um but that I, when I realized that this is now being made, I've decided to withhold that kind of stuff. And, and after people have watched the show, after they've actually seen what happens plot wise, I'll be willing to take those documents and hand over the scripts and be like, Hey, if you want, you asked for this a year ago here, you can go and read it now. But I now want the first experience for people to be the product, not the process. If you know what I mean? So that's um, why you haven't replied to any of my texts yes i also um muted your number and reported you to spam watch thank you we're uh, at the end of 2019 and 2019 is the end of a decade that's weird isn't it it is a bit weird we're coming i mean we're not we're closer to six years of this podcast than we are to five at this point um we're saying goodbye 2014 yeah we're saying goodbye to the 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 teens, the teenies, the twenty, the twenty teens. What is this? Yeah, what's it going to be called? We're entering the twenties. Isn't that kind of fun? Twenty tens. We're at, no, well, no, we finished the, the t- we, we finished the tens. We're into yeah, the twenties. They'll call this decade the twenty tens. That'll the be teens? the easiest. Way. Yeah, I don't know. Nah. What do you call the ni- You call it the nineteen tens. But no one talks about the nineteen tens. Everyone either talks about the turn of the century or the twenty, the twenties. That that first twenty years of a of a century seems to be like, kind of, hand waved away, doesn't it? Well, they call it like, the I generation. <laughs> yeah, that's more about the people. Either way, the point being that we're coming to the end of a, a fairly uh, tumultuous decade in a lot of ways, and a tumultuous year in a lot of ways. Um, yeah. How are you? What What are you? Let's look back just momentarily. Well, I was going to ask you. I feel like I've done a lot of talking. Yeah, you have. You won't shut up. But that's fine. Um, what do you think? I was. I was th- what do you think? 
define will define the decade. I've got a few thoughts. What do I think will define the twenty tens? Yeah. My my thoughts were the Me Too movement and Trump are two big ones. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's been a big decade for women. Yeah. In many ways. Mm-hmm. And all minorities. Yeah. Um, I think those are those are pretty good indicators. So. If you were if you were looking back, um, I say this comparatively to get an idea. If you're looking back at the 2000s, you'd be talking 9/11. You'd be talking talking like Middle Eastern conflict, yeah, um, democratic kind of upswing. The iPod, the iPod, the iPhone. Actually, you probably would talk about oh, the iPhone. I wasn't the, smart, the smartphone revolution began yeah. in, the, in the 2010s, and that really changed a lot of stuff. Yeah. Um, the uh, I think you'd well it depends on how narrow you're looking, but it's it also um, like the complete change of the media industry away from television, away from radio, into the digital world, and and all of the the implications thereof. Yeah, social media um, and going wild, YouTube going wild, all that kind of stuff that began in 2005 onwards. Mm-hmm. Um, so the 2010s. Uh, Feels like there's somewhat of a revolution in in the same way that maybe the seventies had a revolution. Well, at go, least go, it, yeah. For, explain that. Well, in terms of how the the seventies, at least in like theory, feel like they were the time of revolution and um, I can I guess coming like directly out of the great wars and stuff and mm. um, have it, there was like a cultural revolution where drugs and I don't know, Sex. sexuality was yeah. a little bit less prohibitive and I don't know. Do I, This is a tangent to what you just said, which I want to get back to, but do you think of a decade in the, 19, uh, the 20th century as more homogenous than our image of the past decade has been. Do you think that it there's actually been more shit happening in this past decade than happened in the ten years of the sixties or the seventies, or do you think that's just the the lens of time? Because when you think about the seventies, it kind of like we have a we're, we're talking about it right now. We have yeah. a picture of what the seventies is, right? Yeah. But in real time, when you're leaving that. That was ten years. Exactly. Long, you know, I was thinking about this the other day, and it it does feel like those decades are a little bit more distinctive, like the eighties. Yeah, eighties to me uh, seem like the most distinctive decade. But it's almost aesthetic, though, as well. Isn't it is it? like though. the sixties is an aesthetic. Because like fifties an aesthetic. Ma- but the fashion, 70- fashion is so wrapped up in that stuff. Absolutely. And like, then the nineties. But I think the twentieth century is harder to define in my head aesthetically. Still. Yes, but I think they would definitely be able to in the future. They will be. Yeah. Yeah. Give it time. They yeah. will be. And I think it is the lens of time. Yeah. And I think it, it, at, at in like 1978, they wouldn't have been able to, they'd be like, what? It's what, been 70s? like this. this is just, I guess this, this is, is now. Yeah. And, and the 80s and the 90s. But that, I mean, but, I suppose that compresses over time as well, because then you have the 19th century, which <laughs> wraps up an entire 100 year period in one sort of mental image, doesn't it? Yeah. The 1800s, the 1700s, you know. The further back in time you go, the more homogenous it all sounds. Right? Exactly. But I wonder if that's actually not entirely invalid because isn't the whole point of of society that it's improving and evolving at an accelerated, like an exponential rate? Right. Yeah. Because there would have been, you know, two, two, 10,000 years where, quote unquote, humans um, basically changed not at all. For 10,000 years, they were just like roam, roaming around in like empty fields, doing their best to stay alive, living <laughs> out season to season and hunter gathering, you know, yeah. and that didn't change at all. <laughs> and then the pace of evolution, the pace of technology, the pace of science and industry yeah, and that's everything interesting. has like, accelerated. We don't really think of like <laughs> we don't six, talk... 1630 decade, yeah. the year of the decade of the witch. Yeah. Yeah, that was that time we had that bad snow, and that's about as defined as it gets. Yeah, yeah. The 1630 is the same as 1720. Yeah, you know. 
Um, I am scared about the future. Are you? In many ways. That's interesting because you've always been no, I mean, excited like, about the future. I know, I am. I am. I'm both. But, the, yeah. Just because I, I've been watching this show called uh, Years and Years. Oh, yes. With uh, Emma Bit of a Thompson. soap opera. Emma Thompson? Yeah. Created by Russell T. Davis. Okay. Um, but that, I don't know, that's scary because it's like still Trump is president and it's like set in the near future that everything's still recognizable, but it's like this, I don't know, it just seems like a, a very logical progression of the state of affairs in a couple of years and that show really like gave me the spooks and I think it comes with age a little bit, but the realizing that, that things may not always be stable. I think yeah. I've realized that the in the fragility. last year. Yeah. That, you know, I've grown, grown up 30 years and everything's actually been really sweet as far as my little world's concerned. Yeah. But I think in the last year, I've kind of realized that it can be rocky and there, there may be some shit to hit the fan yeah. in a very real way and that, that it's not always going to be rock solid. No. The, That's um, kind of scary. And I think, you know, we're, we're, we're circling back on that original question of what is this year and what has this decade meant to you? It, it is, or, or what are the, the standout moments of it? I think it is, I think one of the takeaways for me has been the fragility of democracy. The, right. The, the yeah, number yeah, yeah. of ways in which what we take as a guaranteed right, as a human right, um, is susceptible to political change or corruption um, I don't mean that in a criminal sense, just like just that ideal can is not actually perfect. It is not guaranteed. It is not eternal. Whether it's, you know, the, the Brexit thing, suddenly throwing an entire nation basically in, at, to a standstill and, and extricating themselves from the EU at much political and economic cost. Yeah. Or the Trump side of it all where, you know, just untold chaos over there, impeachment, which has happened since we last podcasted. Um, and it, to a smaller extent, Australia, where it seems impossible for the left to have a, um, a prime minister these days. Um, and as a result, the rights of, of you know, uh, journalism, of free expression, like the, the green, um, the environmental strike um, stuff where people were being locked up for protesting, all of that stuff is is a belies a shakiness of democracy and a shakiness of our checks and balances and this kind of thing that is worrying. It makes you realize, oh, sh- sh- like this could really change. Yeah, and I feel like maybe our generation, actually, maybe even our our parents' generation, maybe the boomers, had, they they had a little bit of understanding that that things may not always be s- stable. Because they had their parents who lived through the war, or yeah. even maybe some of them lived through the war. Yeah, and well, no, by def- a boomer is post-war, right? Okay, uh, but they've still got that that but, knowledge I mean, and Vietnam that DNA in a way. Yeah. Like it's yeah. part of the uh, it's part of the conversation at least. Yeah. Uh, their parents, growing up, as you say, explicitly were involved in a huge, you know, global conflict. Right. Yeah, and it's like we're kind of getting the all almost like the mirror image of that where we've started off i think when we when we i don't know when we were growing up i feel like it might just be my perception but it felt like things were solid things were stable and it's Mm. over the last five maybe even 10 years maybe since the the economic crisis of 2007 8 yeah that it's starting to turn and we might start to get into another recession yeah um and yeah, shit might hit the fan and can hit the fan or realizing that shit can hit the fan. Yeah. And I think it, you know, also our millennial generation generation came in after the cold war as well. So again, our, our parents had that sort of sense of, you know, there was a real uncertainty, maybe not so much in Australia, but certainly on a global scale, there was a real sense that, Oh shit, you know, this could end in nuclear apocalypse. Yeah. And we grew up, after that threat had mostly been neutralized or disappeared, the Berlin Wall came down, you know, Russia disappeared into the backdrop and everyone thought, well, that's the end of Russia. Um, yeah. And 
so as a generation, we were in a period of stability, of, of democratic stability. And I think, you know, it, uh, history shows how sick, uh, cyclical that is and circular that is. And I think we've just hit that turning point again where all of a sudden the things that we took for granted are now being exploited. Um, yeah, it's um, the going back to the defining traits of the of the year and the decade, I think Me Too, as you say, was a big one. Um, the minority voices, you know, with um, gay marriage becoming legalized in both US and Australia, that's a big one. Um, Marijuana, I guess, as well. Yeah, to some extent. To some, I, I feel a sign like of that, the, a certain sign of the times. I think I feel like that'll actually. I think the next sort of big card to 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 big domino to fall, if you like, is going to be an approach to drugs and alcohol in the twenty twenties going forward, which will be brought on by a, a different kind of scientific basis. You know, that this whole I think it's war good. on drugs thing. I think has run its course, but it is again the boomers that. Holding on to this ideal, sure, it. yeah. I think I think that's a, that's a good guess. I think it's. I think my prediction would be that, and the um, state of animal farming and agriculture will. It's already starting to turn with this Beyond Meat stuff, and I really think it's going to be a huge part I, I of think, the next decade. I think my ultimate answer to your question is: What will the 2010s be known for? I think it will be known as the arrival of climate change. The, the arrival both practically in the world and the arrival of it as a emergency, as a important political centrist problem, as a topic that saw, you know, millions of people marching around the world, which saw our children coming up beneath us, um, revolting against the elderly for their inaction. Yep. And I think this decade past and potentially this decade coming will be the crux of, you know, when people talk about the dark ages of the, you know, early second millennium, I think there will be a kind of generic label applied to this era at the start of the era at the start of the 21st century, when it was the, the climate catastrophe in which all the science was there, but the, the bigger picture of the, the money and the you know oil interests and the news organizations and everything actively conspired for you know greed reasons to defer action yeah. and when you know people in the 22nd century look back at this era they'll go what the fuck were they doing um in the same way that we look back at the you know 50s and be like oh smoking yeah sure why of course everyone was smoking in cars you damn idiots They'll, I think this this is the turning point for that ecological thing because it's it's apparent. I'm really interested to know um, how you look back at your year and your decade, what your big takeaways were personally and professionally, or you know what 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 yeah, what your takeaways are, what you look to do going forward, what you've learnt, mm. what you're proud of. Even just the big milestones. Yeah. Um, I I feel like I matured over the l- the late the latter half of the decade um, more than I had previously, and I think I'm nicer to people now. And I think, if I'm being honest, I don't know. That's probably. A lot of the time, I feel like I was being a dick um, to establish some sort of superior. I had a superiority complex, I think. Mm -hmm. And in the early part of the decade, I think I was using that to feel superior to people. And then at the end of this decade, I have. mm, I feel like the opposite. I feel like the opposite, like that, that I don't need to do that and have no intention to do that and um you don't think of yourself as superior to everyone you think of yourself as well i don't just another person oh you don't need it i don't need to to feel that because i i wasn't i think when i was doing that when i was younger i wasn't doing it because i 
necessarily felt superior. I was doing it to feel to feel so I could feel superior. Yeah, it was that would it was performative in the sense that it was it was insecure. Yeah, if anything. Yeah, and now I don't, and I feel like I don't need to do that now. But I, I that's that's something I've been thinking about in the last few months, at least. Mm. That um, my I think my personality has changed in that. I remember I, the things that people would say to me or or pull me up on the types of things that people would pull me up on mm. um, no longer not, are applicable not really um, which is yeah that's a that's a fair achievement really I mean there, there are definitely people I think who never become comfortable in themselves and never have that degree of confidence or never are able to fully shake a need of superiority or superiority over others or insecurity about what other people think or that sort of thing. Um, yeah. So any sort of degree of confidence in that realm is, is that's not necessarily easy to come by. I think, um, I think I was lucky to be around good friends uh, or have a good group of friends around that not only would call you out if you were being a dick um, for the wrong reasons, yeah, but would also still, you know, hang around, hang around yeah, with stay you, stay by your side, um, and yeah, we talked a little bit about this at lunch, but like would encourage being better um, yeah. in each other, and so I think I was lucky in that respect, um, and to have you know guys like you and like we i think a lot of my friends we we uh, often get into the into the reeds or the weeds you know conversationally and we don't mind um talking about tough questions and things like that and i don't know i just feel grateful mm. um mostly to have nice people <laughs> around me this is so like wishy washy but no it, it's yeah. yeah i mean it, it it's it speaks again to where you started and where you ended right mm. do you think and this is you know potentially too personal a question but do you think the breakup in the middle of that decade is a turning point for you in that behavior yes and i think I, maybe i don't know how directly it is are you talking about my breakup with my relationship yeah uh yeah um but i i don't i'm not sure how directly it is but i think moving to another city certainly made me appreciate my friends more yeah um made me reflect i had more time to reflect because of i don't know well you don't have i had i had yeah less friends or i had to establish a new group of friends Mm. In another city. You can't take for granted so many things. You can't. And I'm sure you feel the same way in the sense that, like, I don't know, moving away from Adelaide makes me appreciate this place so much. Mm. And I love coming back. I love coming back. Yeah. Uh, And before I'd moved to Melbourne, I probably wouldn't have said that. Yeah. I was too eager to leave. Yeah. Um, It's interesting as well. The... um, uh, so uh, I live in a share house um, in uh, New Zealand. So we've always had floor, four flatmates there. Um, and I've been there for five years now. So I'm, I'm now the the longest standing housemate. And obviously when I moved in, I was the You've newest. You've been in New Zealand for five years. Yeah, coming up five years. Shit. I know, right? <laughs> I know. Wait, how does that? Three years in the production company and two years of freelance. Jesus. I know. Next That's... year... An anniversary, yeah. It's, it's um, next year on January 6th will be the fifth anniversary of me flying over. My goodness, yeah. I remember talking about this, yeah, about you leaving. That's I know. such a trip. I know. I remember- you can, we can go back if you go back and listen to the 35 to 42, that was in that um, episode numbers 35 to 42 of this podcast. This was back in the original iteration of this podcast when we were in the same room every week for um, most of 2014. Yeah. And at the end of it, I had applied for this job. 
and went over for a trial day and then discovered that I'd got the job. And, you know, you can hear me realizing that I'm going to be moving away from Adelaide. That is crazy. Yeah. That's, that's, it's pretty amazing that we've kept doing this for so long. Yeah. We're heroes. (laughs) Yeah. At Um, At this point, the best thing about this podcast is its longevity. (laughs) (laughs) but it is it's a nice it's a nice document in time for and i hope we can i hope we can continue to do this uh for many more years yeah um and just because it's just the this really nice document in time and um I'm, i'm sure the older we get and i was just talking to your dad about and you about, you know, flipping through photos and things like that mm. and feeling nostalgic. I'm sure as we get older and that becomes more important to us, it's going to be even nicer. And, and to and hear the, we get the actual ourselves. voices, not yeah. just see the pictures, yeah. to hear, I think it's going to be great. Yeah. And we're going to hear, we're going to hear our, hear our young selves talking yeah. about what we're going to be like when we're older, man. That's, yeah. That's, that's fun. That's fun. Um, my so my thought about the um the flatmates thing was that our most recent new addition to the flat he's only been here for um i don't know six weeks two months um is an american guy and um i recognize some of the insecurities of a first you know overseas live like just completely displacing your entire life and ending up in a new place with no friendship circle right. and and so i'm sympathetic to those like everyone going through that process of complete like disorientation what do i do on the weekend what i used to do on the weekend was hang out with my friends and go to the clubs that i go to and you know as in like hobby clubs or you know do my sports or you know the activities i'm, I'm you're sounding a lot like a guy who doesn't have any hobbies and who's <laughs> never been to a club you know, um, uh, um, you know i went to the everyone, you know when I, on the weekends and uh, i went to mache, the clubs yeah. and uh, did my hobbies and you know did my sports yeah. uh i do sports yeah i am um, the, the discotheca um <laughs> but you know like you fill your time with um with uh rituals and events and things that you've slowly accrued over 20 years or whatever and then when you completely leave it all behind and start from nothing you have to find okay what what do i want to do what do i who do i do it with and how do i fill my time and that disorienting first six months in any new place you're like oh shit i can't just you know go around to my parents place for dinner or i can't just go to the movies with a friend because i don't have enough friends yet you yeah. know you have to or actively establish those connections you're rebuilding so. all that stuff um and and, vul- so- vulner- and it's vulnerability and vulnerability is kind of always good i think and you know, being, it's always a lesson yeah and being i don't know brave enough to be like i need to go and make new friends like yeah. actively new- make new friends to feel at home and comfortable in this place or whatever and so i you know i'm very sympathetic to that and i try to be you know helpful in in you know this new flatmate settling in um but at the same time i know that part of it is you have to find it yourself as well so if i tell you everything or if i bring you into every friendship thing that i do um one it'll feel forced but two it will actually take away your own ability to you know find your footing yeah if it's all done for you as well so i I just watching sort of. And that's like why you've a, been. That's why you've been bullying him yeah. online, and that's why I um, have been hacking into his profile to uh, just make him look like an idiot in front of people. <laughs> just bring like him sink back or down swim, to motherfucker. Bring him back, back down to earth. <laughs> um, but yeah, I've been watching with a, a fatherly gaze of like, oh, you know, I remember those early days of the new city and trying to find, you know. <gasps> Funnily enough, that's the name of my new band, Fatherly Gaze. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> We're a drag band. By yeah, the way. no, I think that was implied. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, that's that's a good thing to take away from the decade and the year. And what about I you? I mean, I feel like you've accomplished lots. See, I, yeah, I, I, th- I still have an insecurity where I feel like I project that I'm busier or more accomplished than I actually am day to day. And you I don't... Th- wait, so you feel like... I, I don't feel like I accomplish as much as people ascribe to me. Or I think they think that I have to work harder or do more on this. Like, a lot of my days this year, 
you could fairly look at and say that I did nothing. Really. Well, that's the beauty of living away from everyone overseas. I mean, you can say whatever you want. Yeah. And people would just have to take it on face value. Just give them like little drips and they'll like, their imagination will fill in the rest. And like, well, he's doing this and this and this. I got to assume that in between all that time, he's, you know, riding on chalkboards. Yeah. Um, doing mind maps. Yeah. <laughs> yeah Venn diagrams. The, um, uh, when I, I mean, when I actually look at the year, at the, at the decade, um, you know, the start of it, I was still studying. So I finished a law degree and a media degree. That feels like a long, long time ago to me, but that was actively, you know, a good two years of that. Yeah. Or one, yeah, two years of it. And then spent a year saving up and traveling and then oh, came yeah. back. I had my health issues. So I was dealing with my heart stuff in 2013, trying to work out what was going on with my body. Yeah. I only came out in that decade. In this in, decade? Yeah. Shit. I know. So I've only been out for seven years, really? eight years. Eight years? Is that right? Feels so, like way longer. I, I know. It's a bit on the nose now. But um, that's, that, so in the start of this decade, I was in the closet. Wow. That feels like a long time ago. Man, this big decade's been huge. It, yeah. And then moved to New Zealand, started working in TV, spent three years working on TV shows, then got through that, went freelance, started writing a TV series, started working on like some video games, acting as an actual professional screenwriter for various series. And end it quite nicely, really, with a TV show I created getting funding. Oh yeah! But like that's a that's a lot. There was a lot that happened this decade for me. You know, it, it, not just in terms of career stuff, but in terms of personal stuff. You know, that's that that encompasses a hell hell of a lot of you know improved confidence in myself and my sexuality and my identity and my ability to you know embrace nerdy things and embrace you know hanging out with different groups of people and being able to like tailor those topics to you know, you know just like to, just to feel comfortable as myself in various situ- social yeah. situations and that kind of stuff I, I, it, it does from my perspective as well just being your friend over the last how long have we been friends 10 12 shit 2006 Seven, it was Wallace. Are you serious? Yeah, 2007 was Wallace. 12, right? 13 years. 12, coming up on 12 or 13 years. Jesus. I know. But yeah, I know as your friend, I've uh, noticed you become, like you are, you're, you're, you are yourself and you seem comfortable with yourself. You seem more comfortable with yourself. Not, not that if you asked me back then, does Nick feel, does yeah. Nick seem to you to be, you know, himself, I probably would have said yes back then, but after that time, like, you seem like Nick. Yeah. You know, like, and you seem, you seem confident and you seem, um, you like, unashamed, unashamedly yourself. Hmm. Which is well, thank you. great. The, um, I would like to think that most of the years, at least in the second half of, this decade with each year that I've felt like I've got better at that. If that's, if that's a goal that you can describe for, if there's some idealized version of yourself where you're the ultimate you, yeah. I, I do feel like each year going past, I feel more comfortable as myself. Um, not that I'm currently feeling uncomfortable really, but just that, you know, you can look back and go, Oh yeah, there's, there's a trend here. Yeah. And I think, I hope that that's true for most people. I, hope, I don't think it is true for most people. You think that people are just staying the same as where they were or regressing or what? I think it's the combination of people wanting to be someone else, be maybe some. Well, it's hard to know who you are. True. And at what point, and who you are changes as well. So how, at what mm-hmm. point do you know that? Yeah. Um, and I think it's it comes down to, confidence and a little bit of not giving a fuck yeah. and having discernible interests and skills that you develop and knowing what you love knowing what you love is huge yeah. um and and, that, that, and i think finding your people is a huge one finding your people finding True. your people because if you are if you are you but you haven't found your people you can be some part of you around them Absolutely. but you can't be all of you because you wouldn't be comfortable being yourself yeah 
Yeah. So if, you know, like I think that was a huge thing for me when I moved over to Christchurch and joined, you know, this TV production company because there were people there that were my people, you know, and they shared the same interests and had the same passions and the same drive and enthusiasm and that sort of stuff. And not all of the same, um, you know, exact specificities. Like I have, I have a friend who's an incredible um, uh, editor and director and stuff, and he does uh, wrestling. He's a huge proponent and and advocate for uh, wrestling in New Zealand and has made a TV show this year, which was broadcast on TVNZ that was professional wrestling that he basically did single-handedly. And that's one of those things where it's like, I'm, do do I have much knowledge of wrestling? No, but it's the exact same enthusiasm and skill set and passion and excitement that you can, as an outsider, look at it and be like, yeah, fuck yeah, man, get your fucking wrestling show made. This is awesome. And it's when you find those people around you that have that same kind of vibe or enthusiasm and and can share that respect back and forth with you and enthusiasm for your successes in the same way that you can be enthusiastic for theirs yeah that's when you can still be more of yourself totally yeah no you're right that is huge um and so you found you feel like you've found your people in New Zealand yeah and I, that doesn't mean that there aren't those people here e- either or that I couldn't have found them in Melbourne say or whatever but I think that's just one of those turning points where if you look back at that year being able to end up with a degree of uh confidence in the direction of your life as well like I, so I sure again this, at the start yeah. of the year I was at the start of the decade I was studying law yeah. really just cuz I could not cuz I knew that what I wanted to do and yeah. I got to the end of it and I had that question of like, well, I, I think I'm pretty sure that I don't want to be a lawyer. So what does that mean? What am I going to do? And thankfully, I, I found an answer to that, which worked out for me. But that helps you as well, you know, to know what it is you want to do. Yeah, I think I'm, I think I'm struggling with that uh, a little bit myself because I feel like there's so many things that I would like to do, but wish that I'd realized it earlier and there are certain things that I think I'm good at, but don't necessarily want to be your career. So well, yeah. yeah. Um, and it's a lot of, um, yeah. It feels like standing a little bit in, in no man's land that you just kind of like, I don't know, I could go back and study, but I don't want to add to my hex debt. But um, I also don't want, would never want to be one of these guys that just, uh, doesn't like just does something for the sake of it i yeah. don't think i don't think that's a viable You're too option passionate. yeah um so it might just have to be just sucking it up and so know. what what um how do you view your career path because uh, uh, as an outsider yeah i think of you as a very smart passionate creative intelligent guy and that's my one hope for you going forward is that you can find a job which lets you be that and do that in a way that's satisfying which is not to say that you are currently unhappy but i no, i, but that's I exactly, get the that's sense exactly, that you could be more you know that, that, that's exactly that's exactly what I, i'm just i really would like um to be creative in in basically any capacity any time in my current job that i've i've had the opportunity um to be creative it I just like I, my brain just switches into another gear, yeah. and it's um, so obvious. But a little bit, I feel like you know. Um, sometimes I feel like Jim. You know when he does. You know when um, in the later oh, seasons the of office. the Office where he doesn't accept the the job with athlete. Yeah, and then he's back in the office and he's playing like silly little games, and Pam's watching him going. This guy's like, just like kind of messing around, like doing nothing. But I, I've considered one of my goals for this year is to start doing stand-up comedy. And I think that's where we're like going to start. And mm-hmm. just like, I th- that, that comes out of, um, I don't know. I, do, I, don't, I don't know where to start with a lot of this stuff. And a lot of the time I'm kind of like looking uh, at like what you're doing and, and um, trying to get cues from uh, what you're like, how you're like 
throwing yourself into projects that you are passionate about because that's that's all I want to do. Is I want you to be passionate about mm. something that I'm working on. Um, but I do feel like sometimes like I don't know where to start. But it's like a lot of self starting is not my forte. Mm. Uh, I. I would love to ideally step into an existing framework yep. where I could develop skills, but being a self-starter or coming up with, I'm never going to, I don't think I'm going to come up with a script and then really hone it or something. I don't think that's me. I It would be. But I mean, you, you have done that in certain contexts because writing an album is that, isn't it? It's sitting down and being like, I'm creating something from scratch. There's no template here. Yes. No. And so, but that that's, that's what I meant a little bit before when I said that, that I think that's what I'm good at, and but it's not necessarily what I want to do. When I was doing this Christmas song, foreshadowing, that I hadn't really worked on music, and I opened up GarageBand and hadn't used GarageBand ever. Yeah, and that's what I was doing it on because I don't have internet, so I can't download Ableton. Blah blah blah. Yeah, yeah. So it's been four years since I've done that. Yeah, and um, I'm doing it without internet as well. Yeah, <laughs> and so it was a bit of a slog, but my brain just switched into this fucking ridiculous Ritalin, like I'm just taking a whole bottle of Ritalin. Yeah. And it, I'm staying up until like four or five in the morning, just going clicking. And I know I can feel sometimes my eyes are just like so wide. <laughs> yeah. My pupils are dilated. I'm going to work at like 9 a.m. Yeah. I know that it's 5 a.m., but I'm so fucking wide. Yeah. And it's just the stimulation it's, it's of the doing the thing. It's creative expression, yeah. And um, I mean, this is something that Emma hasn't seen before because we've, we've been... And she's like, what is, what is what this? What mode is this? Yeah. Uh, because in a lot of aspects of my life, I'm so distracted. Yeah. And realizing, I was saying this to my dad last night, like doing this Christmas song, it's a bit of a wake up call in some respects. It's like, okay, so this is definitely something that I probably should be developing, but I don't, I don't even know if I want to. And I don't know if I want to go down the path of being, trying to be, I don't want to, I almost don't want to try to be a musician and fail yeah. uh, or, or not be able to make it fin- financially viable because I, I like making music, I do, but I also really want to find a work way to make it just you know, financially sort of have the beneficial. the nine-to-five aspect of it where it's a little bit more reliable and stable yeah. and you can apply your creative energies to things whimsically almost like as a exactly. hobby rather than risk sucking the fun out of it by having it be necessity that's exactly what it is and it's uh, yeah but that's that's an achievable goal right i mean yeah I, I, the the whole self-starter thing still plagues me to this day like like i said i for all that it feels like oh this year great year you know uh started uh created and pitched the story of a video game which will be you know, not entirely happening, but coming out next year. And um, then, you know, working on an animated series and, and writing scripts of that as a quote unquote professional screenwriter and uh, developing this, um, you know, new TV show, which is going to air next year. The amount of actual free time and days in which nothing was happening would is like <laughs> worrying. And I would definitely have those days where I was like, okay, you need to start a new project. You need to do something else because you're in between all of these other freelance gigs and you've got this spare time spare time which people would kill for people who are in the slog would absolutely kill for a monday where they actually don't have anything going on yeah and would love to do something and you end up just spending it you know like oh i'll go for a run and yeah because you can't you you have lunch and then you can't appreciate it like that you do some washing and all of a sudden it's like three o'clock and you haven't really sat down or done anything yet. Yeah. So it's like, well, it's three o'clock. I mean, what am I going to get done now? I better open up the shard, mate. Yeah. yeah. So like, like I I don't, I, I, what I'm trying to say is that I don't want you to think that I am uh, like magically great at self-starting either. Cause there are definitely projects and things that I sort of half started this year that did not get finished. Yeah. And I I don't, I think I'm realistic with that as well. I'm, you know, um, but I, I mean, it's, it still doesn't mean that I, I don't, I mean, I like it. I like it. Yeah. That's, that, that's just the, what it is. I, I like having you in my life to kind of look at what you're doing, how you're doing things and mm. your, your mental and professional approach to things. It's, it's, um, it's beneficial mm. to, uh, to hear. 
so why you know you said okay um next year i want to do stand-up comedy why is that the expression that you want to do is that because you'll be f- sort of forced into it by a timetable like yes. a schedule that it's like well it's saturday night so i know that i can get some open mic time or something yes so um i did i have i did actually attempt it once uh but no this is about 20 or 21 and i don't know i got spooked but I don't did know. Did you actually do it or you just went to a I went to an open up? mic. Yeah. But no, did, did you stand up? Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, and I got super spooked. Was this at the Akaba? Yes, it was. <laughs> How did you know that? Because I didn't know this story. Uh, um, but I, I don't know. I, I just feel like it's a, it's a place to start. And I think from there, I don't know, I can kind of work out. It first of all, give me a little bit of structure. I can try and actually write something for something to it and the i've spoken to a few guys that we do a comedy night at howler yeah and they they say like get five four or five minutes Mm -hmm. of material and then you can start taking that to open mics and then you can it's just like it's just a a, a, somewhere i think it's a time i can start Yeah. yeah and that will force uh force some actual materialized work. Yeah. Um, and, and that's really, I've already started well. that and that's like, it's, it's interesting, like trying to, you know, trying to write down jokes and it's not, and it's not easy. Mm. And, you know, and part of, part of what is um, nerve wracking about that, or even just saying it to you. And I don't know why I just said it to you while we're recording uh, so rather than just know. like on fucking, private which yeah. is what i should have done um but it's like you kind of i've got this thing in my head and it's i don't know you feel like if you say that to people <laughs> you say i want to try stand up comedy they're like oh you think you're a funny guy do you yeah um and so there's there's a bit of that That's and like oh, do tip. i think i'm a fucking like i'm one of these guys that thinks oh i'm funny amongst my friends like i'm just gonna take yeah. it like so but i think i've got that self-awareness that I don't think that, yeah. and I think doing it for the the right reasons. Yeah. Um, although no good comic has ever really started in their thirties, they've always I'm been sure doing it for. I'm sure that's not true. I'm probably. sure it just seems true. like it's not. But I think I don't know. I think I think it's a good idea. Yeah. Anyway, I mean, I'm I'm facing that same thing now, which is slightly different because it'll be thankfully with a lot of other people's help rather than just one person <laughs> right. um, in front of a crowd with instant feedback. Um, but like that same thing of like, why are we writing a comedy series? This means that we think that this is funny. Right. This means that we've like written jokes into this and we hope that people will laugh at it. But there's every possibility that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty confident actually that if when my mom sits down to watch my show, she'll be like, oh yeah. You know, but she won't like laugh at it. Probably, I don't think she'll laugh at my show. Yeah, um, because it is so subjective. But also, like, there's a very real risk that even we won't laugh at our show. They're like, which one's the flea bag? Yeah. Who, yeah. Is, <laughs> <laughs> um, but like, yeah, that um, at least we have other people that it goes through, and actors who can say it funny, even if it's written kind of air. Eh. And then even in the edit, we can like drop a joke that really doesn't work or do something to try and make it work. Sure. Live, you know, and this is this is encouragement, not discouragement, but live, it's like, it's up to you. And, you know, you you earn all of the benefits of a joke going well. Totally. You get the laughs and the, you know, the instant feedback. And that's all yours. Yeah. If, if I make a show which is half funny... That'll be thanks to the hard work of about 60 different people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which I'm happy to share the load on. Totally. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah, it's, 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 yeah. In that, in that sense, it's stand up comedy is like super raw. Yeah. In that, in that sense. Um, but I don't know. It's something to, something to try. Yeah, I don't know, excites so me. The, it the excites art. me to think about. And when I really, when I was having the, uh, the thought to maybe attempt it um, earlier on in the year, 
I realized that the only thing that I'm listening to is podcasts about comedians and just like comedians process. And I was just doing that completely. And that's, I was just, just like a study course. with it. Yeah. And without even realizing, like, well, we're not realizing, but without even having the thought that maybe I should try this myself. Yeah. Mm. But I don't know. Well, that's exciting. Know. It might, well, I, I, I am, I do feel excited by it. But you've also yeah, found, like, it. this year you started to work at the radio station, which yep. I think that that probably reinforced again that, like, getting a little bit of a, a taste of... Yeah, it totally did. Absolutely. And I also think for, even for um, Deep Fort, like, I don't know, I think this year it took it a bit, <laughs> well, a bit more seriously and wanted to, like, come to come to the phone call that we have with stories and eat I like i'm yeah. not saying that that works all, all the time but no it's at least wanting to bring that and kind of wanting to contribute to making it a bit of a tighter ship yeah um and <laughs> <laughs> he says as he rambles <laughs> i was just laughing at the idea of it being a tight ship yeah dude this a is a well-oiled rig <laughs> this is this is a well-oiled boat and we like it tight yeah that's how we do it <laughs> um cool well in the uh spirit of inclusion i hope that all of you guys at home as well have um had good years but also i'm curious to know what what it's represented for you we haven't really talked politics at all um but good. <laughs> yeah which is probably good as well but what is the 2010s what would they be known for what did it look like to you how do you feel compared to who you were at the start of it to the end of it. I'd be curious if you want to email in and just give us give us a, a rough outline. Then. The other thing is like the 20, the decades are so arbitrary. Like it's not like we change, we just, okay, 2020, now we change fashion, everybody, and everyone just buys new clothes. Yeah. They are arbitrary and they start, it's not like they started from like the beginning of time either. Yeah. It's just like some date that someone picked. But it also Jesus. does serve as quite a <laughs> sudden Jesus, yeah. Does serve as some sort of like, framework for okay, reference. This is day one. <laughs> Just so everyone knows. Starting. And time begins now, now, you guys. Okay, <laughs> welcome to the party. Um, <laughs> is American? What? Um the uh the that I think one of the giveaways when you're watching like a period movie, particularly in like the 20th century, is if a it's set in the periods. yes, when it's set in the um, 60s, if all of the stuff that you see everyone drive is or use or whatever is from the 60s or wear is 60s, that's anachronistic because most of what was there, at least at the start, was it's the 50s yeah. that came through and bled through and then stuff started to sort of percolate. And again, most of the stuff that's quote unquote 60s was probably more visible in the 70s yeah. because again, the, the, no one's buying the absolute top line, most expensive brand new couture fashion in any decade. Sure, It sort of percolates down and then Kmart yeah. gets its hands on it and gradually, you know, a few years later, it becomes quote unquote the style. Yeah. That's like part of the reason why I like that movie Her so much. Yeah. With Joaquin Phoenix because it was like an attempt at okay, what's the what's the future fashion going to be like? And it's like a little bit retro, but still mo- like it was like at least an attempt. Yeah. But it wasn't like this crazy attempt where everyone's like wearing like cr- huge pointy shoulder pads yeah. and helmets. Well, look at Blade Runner. You know, Blade Runner, which is now an altered history movie because it's set in 2019. Yeah. Oh um, shit. We've crossed the time. So when it was made like in the, the 80s, orig- the original Blade Runner was set in the 2019 and so we've crossed the threshold of, of the future that was depicted mm. um and so now it's altered history oh, wow. not um you know potential future wow um but you look at you know that fashion thing was very 80s style you know picture of the future yeah. the trench coats that kind of stuck around but all of the like see-through plastic um you know dresses and that sort of thing did not quite eventuate yeah um, well, it depends where you go yeah true um Shall we uh, wrap this up with a little bit of a Christmas sing-along? I am so fucking excited for this. Uh, I don't even remember where the idea came from, but a few months ago, I think I um, flicked you a message to say, uh, hey, I think it would be nice to um, try and write a Christmas carol, write a Christmas song. So you're like, uh, I don't even know where this idea came from. I think, uh, I, I, yeah, 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 I said no. Where it came from in my head. Right. Okay. 
<laughs> specifically. <laughs> I wasn't. Okay. I wasn't trying to be faux, faux modest. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. who? I don't even know who said this. But when I sent you the message, <laughs> that's what it sounds like, man. I'm sorry for misleading. I I don't know why I thought of this, but I I thought it would be fun to write um some original Christmas music. So much I think of um the Christmas uh, oeuvre of of music it tends to be you know North American centric. It, it's it's. Uh, it's it's Wait. decades old, you know. I, I think there's Tread just lightly here because you might be treading on some of my territory. I'm just saying, I I, I think there's um, opportunity for some, you know, strong Australian voices in the scene. Um, so yeah, this has been a super fun process for me. Uh, I also nutted this out in two days, in three days actually. Brilliant, because of the move and mm-hmm. setting up the thing. Yeah, and, and no internet and all of these aforementioned problems. I also haven't heard from. Emma in four days uh, <laughs> because it's caused a little bit of tension between us. <laughs> Worth it when you hear it. I, I can't wait. So, um, wait, uh, shall we go out? Um, how, how, do you need to take it? Answer. Who is it? My dad. Yeah, answer it. Hey, Dad, uh, you're on. You're on speaker on the podcast, by the way. Okay. All right. How are you doing, son? Do you need a lift? Uh, no, I'm. I'm good, thank you. Okay. All right. um, can you say Merry Christmas to the podcast listeners? Merry Christmas to all you crazy, crazy cats out there. Very nice. Very yeah, classy, nice. classy. You know what? Uh, maybe I feel a song coming on. Oh, oh, you've actually called at the best time. <laughs> you've actually called it because we're about to do the song. Have yourself a merry little Christmas. Okay, we don't have the rights or the uh, finances to have that. Oh, really? That, yeah. We're going to have to bleep that out. <laughs> uh, give me a call if you want to do this, right? All right, thanks, Papa. Bye bye. Thanks, thanks, Peter. Okay, yeah, enough Classic. of Classic. <laughs> um, let me introduce what my songs, you know, kind of gist is, I guess. I um, am. I can't wait to hear this. I. I, as I said, I alluded to earlier, I feel like there's a lot of dominance from the Northern Hemisphere when it comes to the influence of, you know, snow and 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 that kind of old school Victorian era picture of Christmas. And I sure. thought, you know, there's an opportunity here to really make it something for Australians, you know, something that resonates more with my experience of, of Christmas. Yeah. Um, so I've written a song called Aussie Christmas and I'd um, love to play it for you now. Please do. I can't wait. Trevor left the Stingos in the car again Chuck your tinnies in the trough Never heard you say tinnies before Potato salad has got onion in The Pavis gyms So grab a beer for Ozzy Chris Janet's bringing all her shitty kids Go trip them up in the park (laughs) It's 33 and not a hint Of any wind So grab a beer For Ozzy Grimm Go and get the totem tennis gear Mum and Dad need a talk Didn't get what you want this year But never fear Just grab a beer just grab a beer for Ozzy Christmas. Yeah.
Yeah. Well, I like this part. part where when you shut thinking. up. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Very good. Predictably, like, surfing Stephen-y. Okay, yeah, I, that's, that's what I thought and you were going to go. Up. Yeah, I mean, he's the king of Christmas carols, isn't he? He was, but I got the Christmas chimes in there. Uh-huh, got some uh, snow bells. I like the references. Uh-huh. I like... I just was including some of my normal vernacular. Vernacular, like uh, Tinnies and Janet. Yeah, Janet. <laughs> <Which> <laughs> Famously <laughs> Janet. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Um, a tough listen. Tough listen. I think not like a... It, it does look... It dresses some sadness on Christmas Day, you know? It was a little bit sad. Yeah. Yeah. This is like, I think, a, a great Christmas song. Once people are starting to leave uh-huh. and you're a bit drunk uh-huh. in your chair and you're starting to think about next How you year. got here. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I don't know, I felt it and it felt, it felt, it felt like it echoed the landscape and I felt the 33 degrees. Usually is thirty three degrees on Christmas Day, isn't it? Yeah, at, at least. Um, and I felt I, f- I felt like it represented um, my Christmas. Brilliant. Thirty three degrees and sad. Yeah, which I think <laughs> universal could be the title of the song. <laughs> yeah, I can know. late minute adjustment. And also great because I've gone in completely different direction. Good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm very excited. The polar opposite. Oh. Um, Christmas joke. It's, the puns are flowing, <laughs> as is the uh, the hose are hoeing, <laughs> the hose are hoeing, <laughs> and not the Santa hose. No. You know what I mean? The, the panty hose. Prostitutes. <laughs> okay. Um, Please, yeah. I would love for you to explain how you tackle things. Okay, so I think I started. I started writing it and deleted mm-hmm. it once. Mm-hmm. I wanted to go for I love Christmas songs. Mm-hmm. Uh but like the I like the kind of songs that I liked were the ones that have a hint of melancholy, a hint. Mm-hmm. No, no, no. <laughs> not ones that reflect sort of a shattered marriage or like Yeah. Yeah. Um but the ones that was that one of my favorite ones is um like I'm not saying I was going for last Christmas, but I like I like that song as the last yeah, Christmas. Yeah, yeah. I like um um I don't know what the song is called, but it's like, and so this is Christmas. Oh, it's and called, what? and so this is Christmas. Oh, yeah. and war is over. War yeah. is you like ones which is like over. coral and, and, and grandiose. Yes. By the way, I love the ambient feel that okay. last month. No. Yeah. Last one. Um, so I think that's what I was going for. And I, when I started it, I Googled, what rhymes with Christmas? A group, a rhyming dictionary to Christmas, mm-hmm. and I worked with start. that mm-hmm. as a basis. Cool. So it might sound like it doesn't. Actually, I'm not gonna. What's the title? What's the name? Um, it's called uh, "When I Come Home for Christmas," and in brackets, mm-hmm. don't make me do the dishes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's uh, let's enjoy this now. <laughs> girls and boys all over the world from mexico to rio paris and old london town waking up on christmas morning to see the sanity and the milk and cookies and wet presents under the tree <laughs> spare a thought for those who won't have a christmas this christmas for example the jewish community doesn't even really count it as a holiday <laughs> so when you're opening presents and fist bumping your mama just remember that some people actually want to get rid of Christmas altogether. And those people are called Democrats. Merry <laughs> Christmas, everybody! <laughs> really unsettling. Yeah. 
Was my boy Casper Moxham on the on the rap? Casper crushing it. Uh yeah, and he's included some deep thought references to I, yes. simulation theory as well as Chris. Now, this is why that was so fucking good mm-hmm. because the this was on Saturday. <laughs> it is currently, Saturday. It is currently Monday. <laughs> oh, sorry. No, so I had to finish it by Saturday because I was yeah. leaving. So on Saturday, I. Told him I was doing this song. Um, and then <laughs> I think he was even like, he was even asking what I was doing. And I was like, I got to finish this song. That's why I couldn't come out. And he was like, do you want me to rap on it? And I said, I have actually got this breakdown bit <laughs> yeah. for no reason that <laughs> yeah. I could, you could rap over. perfect. So I sent it to him yeah. and he had plans. He was like going out for drinks with Emma. He... <laughs> Emma said, <laughs> Emma said, yeah, Casper didn't come because he was you at home doing a shit. rap for your Christmas song. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, what a friend. Um, so Casper oh, stayed home, worked on that for like a few hours and yeah. got it to me. And it was fucking, fucking fire. Dude. Unbelievable. Yeah. Gosh, blows me out of the water. What an incredible accomplishment. I loved the various stages of it. I, it was very course. unsettling at the start, the way you pitched Thank you. Pitch changed your voice up I w- to... I was an elf. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Is that what you're going for? Slightly conservative <laughs> racist elf. Yeah, just like, a, <laughs> just like an elf with le- um, right-leaning views who <laughs> use Wikipedia. <laughs> but, yeah. So it like, starts in one place. Then you go into quite a nice, like, sort of simple Christmassy jam. Loved it. Yeah. You, you rhymed mess and miss, which is yeah, arguably, you. you know, on the verge of allowable. Well, but rhyming dictionary allowable. I wish you'd so. gone for isthmus. As, um, as uh, that came up do you google that we went to the same dictionary no no we? you sent a picture of me oh did uh, i <laughs> sent a picture to me of christmas rhymes did which I? included isthmus yeah so i would have liked to see you work Cheers. that in i was hoping i was waiting for it but no you isthmus. went with mess still don't know what isthmus means it's i think it's like a uh like a, a a bit of the land that sticks out into the ocean okay but you know thanks now you know there's a nice little stocking stuff of that fact (laughs) you're the one who just included (laughs) like judaism facts in your christmas rap um but yes regardless so leads you in and then takes a turn that i did not anticipate yeah casper dropping some sick rhymes uh very impressive kind of upstaged you a little bit um you think yeah i mean it's really upstaged me i think everyone will be talking about the rap it's like if if adam and eve upstaged god yeah i think i mean Sure, I'm proud of them. I'm talking about I'm God. <laughs> you're, as, you're God in this moment. But at the end of the day, I still creation. facilitated their awesomeness. Yeah, but the thing is, like, does God really get any credit if Adam and Eve hadn't gone off and done something worth telling a story about? Look, Do you know what I mean? Okay, look. Um, God, who, don't who, try who and turn it, me on, Casper. Who would have heard of God okay? 
if Adam and Eve hadn't gone off and like <laughs> made some shit happen. Look, he he he's a, he's actually a very good freestyle. It went out what, a party trick of his to get drunk when uh-huh. we get sufficiently drunk uh-huh. is he'll just go freestyle. Give man. me a topic yeah. and he'll just freestyle. So amazing. Yeah. As I said, it shows you up. And yeah, he he listens to the to the pod. Brilliant. A lot. So champion, yeah. a hero. He is. D- saved Christmas. Um <laughs> Production value impeccable. Thank you. Um, On GarageBand, never used GarageBand before, by the way. There you go. Yeah. yeah. First time. Don't like it, by the way. Well, you wouldn't know. Yeah. <laughs> um, well done. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you. Should we pop this? I reckon we should pop this. Should we pop them up on YouTube? Do yeah, I don't know. Yeah, we'll find somewhere. If, if you want to go download those tracks, sure. We'll find a place and we'll put it in the Facebook group. So. Yeah. 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 Um, I really enjoyed that exercise. So. Well, um, next year. Same time, same place. If you've enjoyed listening this year, thank you very much. And I hope that we can get this out to you just before Christmas and maybe it uh, offers you something to do instead of speaking to your family and friends. Um, So if you want to take part in our ongoing podcast conversation, send an email to deepfort at gmail.com. Find these tracks on facebook.com forward slash deepfort, you know, twitter.com slash deepfort. Probably Spotify now. But yeah, I mean, now we'll be getting millions in those royalties. So Reddit. <laughs> Reddit will be all over it. Um, the uh, b- b- Apple podcasts, you know, just give us a rating there if you happen to be in the vicinity. Um, and to Email all... us in and write us some questions. Yep. Give us a, um, some topics for Feedback. next year. I can't imagine anything of notes going to be happening next year. So let's um, stock those stuffings with, um, with good topics. And... Uh, to Merry all Christmas to you, a Nick. good night. Yeah, Merry Christmas. Um, do you want to have a Christmas hug? We are currently straddling about seven different types of cables, but I see no problem in doing so. <laughs> <laughs>